On the program tonight, the government is moving to ban single-use plastics by the end of next year. What's on the list and why? The Prime Minister faces more questions about the federal response to the pandemic. I'll speak with the minister responsible for the federal testing strategy. And MPs will be here to debate the government's plastics ban and the pandemic approach. And we'll begin tonight with the ongoing questions about the response to the second wave of COVID-19. New cases remain high in the two big hotspot provinces of Ontario and Quebec. And all provinces are looking at ways to expand testing and speed up the processing. On Parliament Hill today, the Prime Minister faced more questions about the federal government's pandemic response. If he actually cared about Canadians, he would have access to rapid tests. He would be trying to fix things like shutting down the early warning system, and he would be doing the right t thing and taking accountability for his lack of action and his failure to protect Canadians. Simple question. How many tests are Canadians going to get, rapid tests, and when? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, one point on which I vehemently disagree with the member for Nose Hill is that I believe that every single Canadian, uh, every single parliamentarian in this place cares deeply about Canadians. No matter how much I disagree uh, with the member from Calgary Nose Hill on a number of things, I know she cares about Canadians and I think that she should expect that all of us care about Canadians deeply because we have come together in this time of pandemic to deliver for Canadians. Health Canada has stepped up, Canadians have stepped up, the provinces have stepped up and yes, the federal government continues to step up, Mr. Speaker. Well, the federal government is buying more than 20 million COVID-19 antigen rapid tests, which can produce results in just 20 minutes. These types of uh, nasal swab tests were approved in the U.S. months ago, but this is the first one approved by Health Canada, and it's not clear when uh, these new test kits will actually be rolled out in Canada and who will get to use them. So uh, let's get some answers. Anita Anand is Canada's Minister of Public Services and Procurement. She has been leading the federal government's efforts to speed up testing and uh, procure supplies of vaccine for Canadians and she is with me now. Good to see you, Minister. Great to be here. Uh, these 20.5 million new antigen testing devices are being purchased along with the 8 million rapid ID now tests also being purchased from Abbott. Uh, we learned about that last week. When will any of these rapid tests be available for use in Canada? Well, I just want to be clear, Peter, right off the bat, that we have been procuring rapid tests throughout the year. The Gen Expert test, for example, is in use in vulnerable communities here in Canada. The uh, ID test that you referenced uh, that we procured last week and the antigen test that we announced yesterday are now in our stockpile also. And the ID now test will begin to be delivered next week. 2.5 million will be in Canada before the new year. And the antigen test has a delivery schedule that we are currently negotiating given that it was just approved on Monday. Okay, so, so to be clear, some of the rapid ID tests uh, arriving next week, the antigen test before the end of the year, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, there's an urgent need for these tests now, and uh, we, we listen to what Canadians are saying about it. The provinces are uh, uh, facing serious uh, spikes in numbers. And these tests are already in use in other countries, including the United States, and have been for months in some cases. So a lot of people want to know why it's taking so long to get them for use in Canada. So I really appreciate the question, and I just want to put the federal role in procurement of tests and PPE and all other procurements for COVID into context, that the federal government is here to support the provinces and the territories, and we're doing just that. And so that was the purpose of, for example, the $19 billion safe restart program, which had money allocated for the provinces to do their procurements if they chose to do so. So we are playing a supplementary role here, Peter. But, are, are, Having, but, but aren't you playing the leading role in procuring testing? There is no question we are leading in both PPE, vaccines and testing. So PPE, we've secured over 2 billion pieces of PPE. In terms of rapid tests, we have um, very many contracts in place and being negotiated for additional rapid tests so that we can support the provinces and territories in what is a need for testing. But these rapid tests are supplemental to the existing testing regime. 
we have the supplies to execute over 200,000 tests per, per week in terms of what we've procured okay. federally. So but I want to stress that this is a very diversified portfolio of testing supplies and strategies. But you're, so we'll take another three months to get the, the antigen test before the end of the year. So that's roughly three months uh, before we get those into Canada. Um, and as I said, they've been in use in other jurisdictions for, for months now. And I guess you you could only start ordering, could, I guess, I'm trying to figure out how the process works. Did you only start ordering them when Health Canada gave the approval? And if that's the case, are you frustrated that it took so long for Health Canada to give the approval? It's, it's a great question, and it does touch on what is the process and what is our approach. Uh, so certainly all of our contracts are conditional on the receipt of Health Canada approval, and we are making sure that we have those contracts in place so that we can execute very quickly once forth, uh, Health Canada approval is forthcoming. Okay, but in terms of in terms of the process, the, because you're seeing more questions today in Parliament, the questions are all about why is it taken so long, and I guess I'm wondering whether you uh, you're absolutely okay with the Health Canada approval system, or whether you wish it had moved more quickly, given the same tests we're using have been approved in other countries. Well, I do appreciate the question, and I understand uh, where it's coming from. But I will say that from a regulatory process, it's important for us to recognize that that Health Canada regulator is independent, and its decisions are based on its own scientific analyses. And I, as the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, don't have any impact on that process. So there's a need for us to understand that the decisions Health Canada are making, is making, are based on science, and also a need to understand that innovation in technology relating to testing is also important. And so on that latter point, we are in touch with suppliers. We are seeking to put in place contracts that are conditional on Health Canada approval so that, as I said, we can execute as soon as that approval is forthcoming. But ultimately, we need to respect the science on this. Sure, okay. There, there are, um, when you say you've been in contact with other, other companies that um, there seems to be a little bit of frustration, if I can put it that way, with some Canadian companies, some 10 of those companies. They've developed rapid tests as well. They're waiting for Health Canada approval. Are those Canadian companies getting serious consideration for their tests as well, or are we only looking at companies from outside Canada? So it's a great question. Um, of course, we saw the same question arise with regards to PPE, and we built up a made in Canada or domestic capacity in PPE. And so in the same vein, we at Procurement are taking the advice of the Public Health Agency of Canada in terms of what tests we should be looking at and which suppliers we should be pursuing. Are any of those Canadian companies? Without doubt, we are looking at a range of domestic and international companies. Okay, there's another problem we're hearing in the province of Ontario, and I'm not sure how directly it connects to you, but uh, let me put it to you that, uh, you know, problems with the, the numbers of lab technicians to protest the tests, uh, sorry, process the test. There's a big backlog. Some of those tests are now being sent to California for processing. Uh, what can the federal government uh, do about helping with that? Well, again, I think it's a good question. Um, in procurement, it's not quite a question that's in my portfolio. Um, but I, I would say that the most important thing for us to remember is that from a constitutional standpoint, uh, the issues relating to health and the distribution of health services rest within the provinces. And so at the federal government level, what we have really tried to do every step of the way is to support the provinces in these issues from PPE to testing. And we'll continue to do that, uh, whether it's Ontario, BC, Alberta, what have you. All right, Minister Nand, uh, thanks for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Peter. Take care. The federal government is pushing forward with a ban on single-use plastics by the end of next year. Right now, Canada recycles less than 10% of the 3 million tons of plastic it produces each year. The ban will target six products. Plastic grocery bags, straws, stir sticks, 
rings for six packs of drinks, plastic cutlery, and takeout food containers made from plastic that's hard to recycle. Those six items make up less than 1% of the plastics manufactured in this country. Stephen Gilbo is the Minister of Canadian Heritage and a longtime environmental leader in this country. He was part of the government's announcement today. Uh, Minister Gilbo, uh, good to see you again. Uh, first of all, thanks for Thank taking you. time to speak with me. Uh, your, your government is, uh, is banning just six plastic items in this announcement today. Why those items and not so many other plastic products that end up in our landfills? Well, today's announcement is, is, is much broader than just banning certain plastics. I mean, what we're aiming to do is really to, 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 to greatly improve uh, recycling in, in Canada and, and, the, and the products that we, that we recycle or that we can recycle that we're not recycling right now. These six products that we're banning, uh, we're banning because they're, uh, they're very difficult or expensive uh, to, to, to recycle. And that they are, there's lots of very viable and affordable uh, options instead of these uh, instead of these projects, uh, these products. Sorry, but 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 overall, what we are trying to do is to ensure that when we use a plastic component, regardless of what it is, it can be recycled again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And this, the, more and more people are talking about this concept of circular economy, where basically. Uh, you would make uh, wasting products a thing of the past. Now, I'm not saying that well, that will happen tomorrow morning, right. but that's certainly what we're aiming for in, in, in the coming years. Okay, do, do you expect the government will be adding more products to the list? Well, uh, not necessarily. We might, but that's not, that's not the objective. Again, you know, I mean, the, the reason we're banning those is because they, 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 they can hardly be recycled. But but what what we, what we will be doing in the coming months is talking with with, with experts, with, with Canadian public, uh, environmental organizations, and obviously the industry, provinces and territories, which are a very important partner in in this endeavor. Uh, we we can't do it without without them. Um, to, 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 to look at how do we do this together because okay. it needs to be a concerted effort. It can't just be provinces or even municipalities. It can't just be the industry. It can't just be individual citizens let me, like let me us. Jump so in it and has ask... to be a, a holistic approach. Okay, let me jump in and ask about the timeline here. The, uh, and I guess some people will, will hear the announcement today and say, like, why is the ban taking another year to implement when those six items that have been named – the discussions, consultations with manufacturers, uh, it's already happened. A lot of those products are already being phased out by the manufacturers themselves. That's so why, why another year? Um, it, it's really the, the regulatory process we have, to, we have to go through in order to, 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 to ban and to, and to put in place this overall strategy. So it, it, it is being done largely to the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, which, which we call CEPA, and they are, they are already provisioned in, in that act that, that very precisely describe what the Environment Minister, my colleague Jonathan Wilkinson, mm -hmm. has to do in order to, to get there. And these things take, uh, to, to, to take a bit of time. But Jonathan said it this morning, like, if I can do it faster, I will do it faster. Okay, well, when are we going to have national targets and standards for recycling as part of your government's promise to have uh, zero plastic waste by 2030? When should we expect to see those? Well, to give you an idea of uh, how far we have to go, so right now about 9% of plastics are, are, are recycled in, in, in Canada. The European Union is striving for 90%, and we think this is what we should be striving for as well. Um, Minister Wilkinson this morning said that uh, he's, uh, he's confident that in the next 12 to 24 months, we will have a plan negotiated with, with provinces and territories, which would enable us to, to, to really increase our, our recycling targets for, uh, for, for plastics in Canada. All right. Is it still the government's intention to designate plastic uh, at some point as a toxic substance? Tell me about that. Well, and, and I know some, some people really in the, in, the, in the industry are hurt by that. I mean, this is just basically the way that specific piece of legislation is, is done. Like it's a label in, in the legislation which, which goes back to uh, when, when this, this bill was first introduced and, and toxic substances were really these things that were like very directly harmful to, to, to our health or, or the environment. Over time, we've, we've added substances to, 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 to that list, which would include, for example, greenhouse gas, which are not, from a chemical perspective, toxics, but have very harmful impact on, uh, on the environment. And now we would be adding these plastics. But as Minister Wilkinson said this morning, listen, if it's, 
you know, if, if the issue is the label of, of that category, we can work on that. So you're, what you're saying, if I hear you right, what you're saying is the, uh, the labeling it of as a toxic substance, if that's what's going to happen, sounds like, uh, like it is, is to allow uh, the regulation of some plastics, but not suggesting all plastics are evil. Exactly, exactly, totally. Okay, the government of Alberta has actually uh, turned to plastics for some economic salvation, hoping to make Alberta a hub of plastic recycling by introducing, uh, I'm asking, I guess, by introducing the plastic bans that you mm -hmm. have and, and discussions around labeling plastic as a toxic substance. Are, are you concerned that undermines Alberta's plans? No, quite the opposite. I, Minister Wilkinson uh, saluted, and, and I would too, uh, Alberta's initiative. Uh, and what we want to do is totally in line with, with what they want to do. We want to ensure that there's more plastic that is being recycled in, in, in this country. And these substances that we're banning aren't being recycled uh, because it's complicated, it's expensive. I mean, can you imagine trying to put in place a... And I, frankly, I don't know of anywhere around the world that has a, a recycling program for, for straws. A, mm. Just the, the, the sheer cost of, of recuperating, transporting uh, plastic straws. Can, can you imagine, like, trucks filled with plastic straws? You would... Like, it, it's just not feasible. But, but there are lots of other plastics that can and should be recycled, and we want to increase the level of recycling, which would make what Alberta's trying to do more, even more profitable. Okay. Let, let's finish on this. We're producing and using tons of plastic uh, personal protective equipment during the pandemic, and uh, yet you're talking about plastic bans and, uh, and perhaps plastic as a toxic substance. Uh, how will those policies affect the production and use of personal protective equipment? It, it it won't. I mean, obviously, we need uh, we, we need to provide Canadians with with safety measures rega regarding COVID. None of the none of the substances that are being banned are uh, are personal protective uh, equipment uh, PPEs. Um, and uh, but on PPEs, we let's work with producers to ensure that if people use them, they're disposed of carefully and they don't end up in, a, in our environment. Uh, there's even some initiatives in Canada right now to, to produce biodegradable PPEs, which we, which which could be used, uh, but but then would, would not be harmful to, to the environment. But, but the way the legislation, the regulation is proposed right now, it, it would not impact our ability to have access to, to, to these PPEs. All right, uh, Stephen Gilbel, uh, always good to talk to you. Thanks for your time tonight. Thank you. In Alberta today, the province's energy minister noted the limited scope of the plastics ban announced by the federal government today, but also warned against federal interference in provincial jurisdiction. Part of our recovery plan in, in Alberta is to incent and to bring in more petrochemical activity that includes uh, uh, manufacturing plastics. So uh, we, we would just say that is Alberta's jurisdiction. It's a key part of our economic recovery strategy. So we'll be following that announcement from the federal government and each and every announcement to ensure that it doesn't infringe on our constitutional jurisdiction and to ensure that it doesn't infringe on our ability to uh, recover our economy and doesn't infringe on our ability to diversify our economy. A ban on single-use plastics, more calls for faster COVID-19 testing and the role of the federal government in all of that. Let's bring in three members of Parliament to talk about those issues. Peter Schiffke is a Quebec Liberal MP and the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. Dan Albus is a British Columbia Conservative MP and the Environment Critic for the Official Opposition. And Gord Johns is a British Columbia New Democrat MP and his party's Fisheries and Oceans Critic. Good to see you all, gentlemen. Thanks for taking time to speak with me. Um, I'm going to start with Dan Albus in the middle here because we heard at length Mr. Shivke from uh, uh, from the minister a little bit earlier. So, Mr. Albus, uh, let me start now with the, the plastics ban announced by uh, the government today. Uh, let me start with you. What, what is your party's response to this ban on single-use plastics? We believe that the government needs to have a pandemic lens, and uh, we need to be looking at the health and safety of Canadians first. We also need to be supporting the economy. And so for the timing of this announcement today, it doesn't bode well. Look, Canadians are using uh, plastic uh, for good or bad uh, because we're in an unprecedented pandemic. And when we see that the lifeline that uh, takeout has for many ma and pa small restaurants, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce has said that we could lose uh, one or, or two uh, out of every three uh, restaurants because they're just holding at the brink. So 
What I would simply say is, is that uh, we, we want to see, like all Canadians, progress on plastic, but we need to do it in a way that works with this pandemic, that works with the economy, and doesn't pour more into uncertainty on so many people that okay. are losing jobs today. I want to come back to some of the points you've raised in a little bit as I work through your colleagues here. Mr. Johns, let me move to you. The House unanimously passed a motion sponsored by you almost two years ago calling for a national strategy to fight plastic pollution. So what's your reaction to the ban of these six plastic products you've heard from the government today? Well, I think it's a it's a good start. I mean, they could have expanded that even further, but certainly in line with what the European Union's doing, we've got a clearly we've got a crisis when it comes to uh, tackling plastic pollution, the impact it's having, especially on our oceans, and we have the largest coastline in the world. So uh, these are unnecessary plastics. Nine percent of uh, plastics right now are being reused. So. This is a first step in terms of, you know, eliminating unnecessary uses of plastics. But we want to make sure that the government goes much further. I mean, they haven't demonstrated what they're going to do around industrial use of plastics in our marine environment, especially um, what they're going to do in terms of, uh, you know, having clear targets on reduction of plastic pollution. They didn't set those out. And I get concerned about, uh, you know, industry pushing for uh, the plastics not to be uh, determined a, 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 a toxic substance. A, a toxic substance. Uh, uh, so this is a concern of ours: is that industries, you know, applying pressure on the government okay. right now, and uh, and it's something that w we know that it's toxic. We know it's having an impact on the environment and on on humans. Mr. Shifke, what, what about to pick up on Mr. Albus's point here? The timing of these changes and the ban. Uh, a lot of small restaurants relying on plastic to help them supply food for takeout during the pandemic. There will be a, a cost for them to abandon plastic. Is the pandemic the right time to be forcing them to start doing that? Well, I think two things need to be pointed out. Uh, you know, the Conservatives like to try and scare people. There's two key points here. First of all, we made it very clear in the announcement that this would not affect PPE, personal protective equipment. We want to make sure that Canadians always have access to the gloves, to the masks, and any other equipment they need to keep them safe during this pandemic. And also look at the timing. We've announced that we want to get this done, uh, the regulations in place, by the end of 2021. So we're not talking about something that we're doing right now during this pandemic. We wholeheartedly agree that we don't want to put any undue burden onto uh, restaurateurs or business owners during this pandemic. But the one thing we have to keep in mind, and it goes to my NDB colleague's point, is that every year that goes by, we are putting 33,000 tons of plastic waste into our forests and our rivers. He pointed out that 9% of what we actually uh, put into the recycling bins, the blue bins that we all use, is actually recycled. A full 90% makes its right. way into what, that. What I'm, asking, so, what I'm asking, though, is you, what about the impact this might have on small mom-and-pop operations trying to, get, trying to stay alive during the pandemic? So the first thing I mentioned was the timing. This will come into effect uh, next year. The regulation we're hoping to have in place by the end of 2021. Uh, with regards to the six that we chose, we chose them for uh, three main criteria, uh, harmful on the environment, uh, difficult or costly to recycle, but also that there were readily available alternatives okay. already on the market. Right. And I know that many organizations, many companies, uh, yes. small businesses or larger ones have already made the shift over to alternatives. All right. let, me, let me use that as a jumping off point. Mr. Albus, uh, uh, these products are, are starting to be phased out anyway by the people who use them. And there are alternatives to all of those plastic items, the government says. So how much of a burden will it actually be for business? Well, let's just put it into context. Right now, you have restaurant owners that are just fighting to stay open. And again, now they are being told by this level of government, by the federal government, that here's one more thing that we have to throw at you. And uh, you know what? Uh, there, are the, you know, the market, there are alternatives, but let's, let's be frank that this will cost uh, those mom and pops uh, more. And some stores right now are already just trying to deal with what they have. Um, so, you know, for the parliamentary secretary to be saying that, oh, no, this is all handled, this is a real concern. And when he says that conservatives are uh, raising fears, well, let me ask him this. There are people in long-term care homes that are being protected because they are utilizing some of the, uh, the cutlery that are used to eat with every day. 
So to dismiss those concerns about public health, uh, you know, and demonize us for raising legitimate questions. Look, conservatives okay. want to see uh, the better recycling. We want to see working with provinces, and we want to see a phasing out of, of these uh, products. Okay, time uh, because time, it's the right thing to do. But time, in terms time, of process, time's running we short have here. questions about how the government is, is carrying this file. Okay, Mr. Johns, quick, quickly to you now. Then I want to move on to another quick topic. Uh, do you see problems here for small business in dealing with this? Well, you know, what we're hearing from many small businesses, they're already moving towards this. Uh, this is legislation that they knew was coming. Uh, it, and I don't believe it's going to be putting anyone out of business to uh, change from a plastic stir stick or a plastic straw to one that is much more environmentally friendly. Uh, you know, again, you know, they, they didn't even look at coffee lids. Uh, they had an opportunity to, to choose alternatives to plastic coffee lids. And I don't think that Tim Hortons or any business, uh, the local coffee shop's going to be going out of business right. by moving towards something much Mr. more sustainable. Mr. Shifke, just uh, shifting gears here, let's discuss the federal government's efforts to provide more testing devices for COVID-19. Still lots of lineups. Government's investigating now private clinics that have started offering these tests for a fee of between $50 and several hundred dollars in some cases. Should Canadians who can afford it be allowed to pay for those private tests and skip the lineups? Well, I think we need to be very clear. Um, charging patients uh, undermines equity. Uh, it goes against the very values of our universal health care system. So uh, the Prime Minister spoke directly to the Minister of Health about this, uh, and she is looking into it, and uh, she's conducting an investigation. The reality is that we want to make sure that every single Canadian, regardless of their financial situation, has access to the tests that they need. We've been working collaboratively with the provinces and territories to make sure they have access to those. Uh, with just in the last week, announcing over 27 million right. rapid tests that have been secured that are on their way, millions of which will be arriving next and week. We, okay, so, okay, we, we heard that from the minister a little bit earlier. So the, the answer is no, Canadians shouldn't be allowed to pay for the test privately. Uh, Mr. Albus, what's your view? Well, let's look at it. Germany and Japan have had access to these rapid tests for a long time. People right now are putting their own health uh, and, and putting their own jobs at risk by having to wait in these long lines. They don't even have the opportunity for a test because the government has been slow, uh, so slow on this file. Look, Manitoba. Okay, should you be allowed to pay for a private? Should you be allowed to pay for a private test if you can afford it? Well, right away, just they by not having even pass uh, Health Canada's auspices, we can't even have conversations. Look, I think that provinces need to maintain the Canada Health Act, and but we also need to be practical and tear down these lines. And part of that is having access to the test. So when you Public say ma maintain the Canada Health tools. Act, should provinces say no to uh, private testing, paid private testing? Well, I, I think every provincial premier will say that they are, will abide by those. But really, how can we even okay. talk about having rapid testing if they don't have rapid tests? That's the problem okay. here. Okay. You know, well, well, we need no, to have are, the federal are... government start to, to approve these things that other G7 countries have had. And you know what? There's no excuse on this front. Okay, time, time running short. But Mr. Johns, I, I want to bring you in on this. Uh, should you be allowed to pay for a private test and uh, out of your own pocket and jump the queue? No, uh, we believe that everybody should have equal access and that everybody should be getting access. People have been waiting. Uh, you know, we, here we are, as Mr. Alba stated, you know, we're far behind other countries when it comes to rapid testing. People are in long lines. They're, they're waiting to get the tests that they need, uh, you know, products that are out there on the market that other countries are using. And here we are in Canada waiting for them to be approved and get to market. And we need to get them out and ensure that every Canadian has access to the test okay. equally and fairly. All right, gentlemen, and thank you all. I'm sorry I got to cut you off there. We're out of time for tonight. But thank you all for your time, and we'll talk again soon. Take care. Thanks thank so much, you. Peter. That's our program from all of us here at CPAC. Thanks for watching. See you next time.